Thank you to the organizers for giving me this opportunity for presenting my research. Uh, I'm going to talk about comparing fiber methods and calculating carbohydrate by summation and various issues with carbohydrate fractions. As one of the energy contributing macronutrients, food composition databases have always included carbohydrates. Dr. Atwater in 1892 determined carbohydrate by difference, and he defined it as sugars, starches, cellulose gums, woody fiber, etc. Uh, today we calculate total carbohydrate by subtracting the sum of moisture, protein, fat, and ash, plus alcohol when present, from 100. But we'd like to move away from that and calculate carbohydrate by summing the individual parts, which would be starch, sugars, and total dietary fiber. Theoretically, the sum of those three components should equal total carbohydrate by difference. Uh, and Dr. Cho just gave this great summary of all the different fibers over the years. Uh, so initially, when we, the 1963 edition of Handbook 8 uh, started including uh, fiber, at that time it was crude fiber. Starting in, 19, in the 80s, we included neutral detergent fiber. And since 1989, we've been including the enzymatic gravimetric dietary fiber. Uh, occasionally, we, we had soluble and insoluble for a while, but there was kind of some analytical problems with that because you'd get soluble and insoluble, but it wouldn't add up to, it generally exceeded the value for total. So <laughs> kind of these analytical issues keep popping up. Uh, total carbohydrate by summation. We'd assay the sugars, and we do the individual mono and disaccharides, sucrose, glucose, fructose, lactose, raf uh, maltose, and galactose, generally done by liquid chromatography, AOAC method 982.14. It does not include the tri and tetrasaccharides and other oligosaccharides. Uh, total dietary fiber, again, by enzymatic gravimetric method either AOAC 985.29 or 991.43. Starch is generally done by an enzymatic colorimetric method, AOAC 979.10. But these carbohydrates do not include dextrins, inulin, oligosaccharides, various organic acids, and sugar alcohols. Some of these carbohydrate and Related compounds not included in total carbohydrate include inulin, uh, which is often found in chicory root, uh, some other fruits, but it's often used as an ingredient in a, as a sub sugar substitute slash fiber in a lot of uh, snack bars and uh, similar products. Raffinose is found in legumes and some other vegetables. Stachios is also found in legumes. Sugar alcohols are found in some fruits and vegetables, grains and mushrooms, but are frequently used as a sugar substitute in uh, particularly uh, low sugar uh, foods and the like. Uh, organic acids, again, found in processed and preserved foods and some fruits and vegetables. And sucralose is found in low calorie foods and beverages used as a sugar substitute. Uh, thanks to the Megazyme Corporation for these figures. I'm sure you've all seen them before. Uh, but this sort of shows the enzymatic gravimetric method and was kind of in here, but there's all these other things that were only partially included in that method. And I believe these little ovals are not proportional. Of course, they would vary from food to food depended on the carbohydrate makeup and what's found. So then looking at the AOAC, the new AOAC method, often called the McClary method, takes a box and includes all these uh, fractions. Oops, how did I get back there? <laughs> okay. Uh, so as part of uh, our ongoing work in the uh, Nutrient Data Laboratory to uh, develop uh, 
you know, keep our food composition databases up to date, we worked with the USA Dry Pea and Lento Council to update the data on pulses. So we collected some samples in 2014 on peas, lentils, and chickpeas. They were picked up in multiple states, the primary growing areas for those particular pulses, Idaho, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Washington. They were analyzed raw and cooked. We did uh, proximates as well as fiber, starch, and individual and total sugars. We did minerals, vitamins, fatty acids, amino acids, and some bioactive compounds. And it was part of our larger analytical program, which we refer to as the National Food and Nutrient Analysis Program, which is funded by uh, contributions from the National Institutes of Health, uh, Centers for Disease Control, and the Food and Drug Administration, primarily. Uh, so looking at dietary fiber in pulses, uh, let me get my notes here. So again, CHO by summation is the sum of fiber, starch, and sugars. First we have a column by difference, then by the summation. And we did it by summation with the enzymatic gravimetric method and by using the McClary method. And these are our values for the uh, fiber we found by the enzymatic gravimetric method and the McClary method. When we combine the sum of proximates and the values using the enzymatic gravimetric, all except for one, the enzymatic exceeded 100. And like, as I said before, ideally they should equal the same value carbohydrate by difference. They're being somewhat more. Uh, when we use the McClary, they all exceed uh, the, the uh, sum of the proximates plus the carbohydrate components, some fairly significantly. The large, you know, the sum of the large Kabuli raw adds up to 106.92. Uh, raw rich lay lentils, a specific cultivar, adds up to 115.76. Uh, green, green Aragon peas adds up to 113, and yellow Admiral peas add up to 114. So. On the cooked peas, uh, using the McClary methods, they were all over 100, pr probably with an acceptable uh, amount of variation, which I'll get into a little later. Uh, these are the values we got for starch sugars in pulses. Uh, oops. Let me go back. I seem to have skipped the page here. Yes, okay. <laughs> okay, so in actually determining the proximates and the carbohydrates, we have seven separate analyses. Four proximate components, moisture, protein, fat, and ash, and three carbohydrate fractions, sugar, starch, and fiber. The McClary method requires some additional uh, analytical. So each measurement, each one of these analytical measurements has a certain amount of uncertainty around them. So when we calculate carbohydrate by difference, we do sort of a quality control check on our data to make sure the numbers all add up. As I said before, ideally the proximates and carbohydrate by difference should add up to 100. But given that because of this analytical uncertainty, for plant products will allow plus or minus 0.5 grams. For animal products, uh, where there's no carbohydrate to kind of soak up that difference, we allow a higher variability, plus or minus three grams. Uh, but we would expect some, some of these values, in kind of in a normal, some to be higher, some to be lower. But in the case of looking at the fiber components, most are higher for the enzymatic gravimetric, and they're all higher using the McClary method. So is there some analytical bias or something in the methodology across the board that, you know, we're not picking up? Uh, it was suggested after some discussions with, I think, a number, a couple of people, some of who were in the audience, that perhaps resistant starch should, would account for some of this 
duplication or excess <laughs> carbohydrate. Uh, so we had resistance starch analyzed by the AOAC method, 2002.02. Uh, the pulses contain type 1 resistance starch, which is kind of it's physically inaccessible. We had some talks on all the different types of resistance starch. I believe there's four different ones. Uh, but since resistant starch is counted as dietary fiber, uh, we probably shouldn't also count it as starch. So it's probably potentially getting counted twice. Uh, so it might explain some of this excess. However, when I got the results back, uh, it explains some of the difference uh, in the rock lentils and dried peas, but not, but not all. And all the cooked levels were below the level of detection. Unfortunately, the lab that did these analysis for us had a rather high level of detection relative to the expected values. Because I've seen some values that, you know, published values having about two grams of resistant starch, and that was our level of detection. So, and so, but not so all bad. Uh, looking at fiber and plantains, uh, the carbohydrate by summation using the McClary dietary fiber for boiled plantains could be within the acceptable ranges, you know, if we allowed more than just adding up exactly to 100. The baked potatoes, the baked plantains were a little higher. Uh, you know, for the, for the bake, the sum was 103.7, and for the boil was 102.5. So the 102.5 is within that plus or minus three that we're discussing for, let's say, the animal products where we don't have any carbohydrate, but again, in the plant products, we're measuring all the carbohydrates, so we have that un analytical uncertainty. The bake was a little high, it's 103.7. Then we looked at some uh, raspberry products, and this is some work that was, we were working with the Processed Raspberry Council. And the carbohydrate by summations were all acceptable. But what was curious about this result is the results we got for the McCleary fiber method were actually less than those by the older enzymatic gravimetric fiber method. So just a question for the analyst, just what's going on or what's different about raspberries. And some of them are, you know, frozen raspberries, but we also had processed concentrates and purees. One person thought, well, maybe it's the seeds, but something like the concentrate has the seeds removed. So. It's a question for the analysts. Uh, some limitations. Again, this was a limited study. Uh, while I had a lot of pulse samples, we in, did enzymatic gravimetric on all of them, but we only did the McClary fiber method because it's much higher cost on a limited subset. Uh, but, you know, there could be uh, some matrix-specific uh, issues going on with the pulses that we ran into those issues, things that we didn't see with, let's say, the, uh, the plantains or the raspberry products. Uh, it is a, you know, the McClary method is a complex method with a lot of steps. Uh, so you need a good analyst who's skilled and, you know, the laboratory has to have good, you know, practices and validates and trains their technicians well. Uh, as I said, it's a expensive and complex method. So all these different steps in there doing can increase the analytical uncertainty. There's limited certified reference materials because as part of our analytical program, we always send out uh, reference materials to go along with the sample so we can validate the results. There's only limited materials that are validated for the McClary fiber method. Uh, so there's issues for food composition data and intake studies implication for changing the definition of fiber. Fiber is one of those nutrients that we have in the database that the results are very method specific. You can just call it fiber, but if you do crude fiber, neutral detergent fiber, fiber by the enzymatic gravimetric, or fiber by the McCleary method, you get very different results. So it's a very method dependent uh, nutrient. It's not something like calcium where you're just going to have calcium. Uh, fiber is very method dependent, so I think we have to put all of them in there by whatever method that was used. 
So inclusion, we, we have an improved definition of fiber, uh, you know, where it's uh, the three or more monomeric constituents plus lignin. I think they finally kind of worked that out, because I remember when I started working almost 40 years ago, they were arguing over the definition of fiber, and they were doing it for almost 40 years. So I think we got one. I think there's some questions, you know, in the FDA regulation about some of these novel fiber constituents and some of the regulatory, but that's not my issue. <laughs> um, but dietary fiber needs to be considered in context of all the carbohydrate attractions and the other proximate components, because in food composition tables, we're trying to report all of those, but have them add up to, you know, describe all the, the whole food. Uh, we need to ensure that some fractions and components are not double counted. Methods need to be harmonized, e.g. starch and resistant starch need to be, uh, you know, if we include resistant starch in the dietary fiber definition, which everybody's telling me is where it belongs, we can't count it also as starch. And there may be some other constituents in there that might be double counted. And of course, from our own research, we do need, uh, we need to analyze more samples and obtain better estimates of variability. So that concludes my talk. Uh, any questions? One thing, I'm a food composition database. There are people in this audience who know a whole lot more about fiber and carbohydrate chemistry than I do. So if there's sort of an analytical question, I leave it to those people. So. <laughs> We have time for a couple of questions. Jan Willem. Yeah, you said uh, you are not an expert in food composition databases. But still, I want to raise one issue about that. You said, indeed, uh, your last point of issue to be resolved if you move from the classical fiber method to the diet and the nuclear method. Yes. You find definitely higher values. Yeah. And, uh, well, since I, we're covering uh, more constituents, that sort of would be expected. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, together with uh, persons from the European Consortium of Food Composition Databases, I was involved in a publication. And the key message was in this publication, if you have a theory method, you can separate it in the high, they the determine separately high electrical weight, and that's more or less comparable to the old uh, fiber methods, mm -hmm. and you have low electrical weight. And we propose that in food composition databases, you should mention those both. Then you can see, indeed, it is measured total fiber. 10 is the fiber is the material method, and 7 is the high electrical weight, and 3 the other. So then, epidemiologists and all can say, okay, if I compare this with other fibers and other databases, other studies, I know what to do. And if I only measure, say, the 10, then nobody knows what is the old and the new. So that is our proposal, and mm -hmm. I think it is yeah, integrated maybe in Europe and things, but I give it for the consideration. Yeah, thank you. Uh, one issue in that, and that's where the, the high molecular weight and the low molecular weight get a little confusing, because there's interest in knowing soluble fiber and insoluble dietary fiber, and exactly how those high molecular and low molecular weight dietary fiber match up with those is a little confusing. I, I think that uh, all those low molecular weights, whether uh, the classical soluble fiber is the high molecular weight soluble fiber. Yeah. And the really classical soluble falls in the high molecular yeah. weight. Yeah. yeah. And so the, the, the low molecular weight fiber is, I think, mostly soluble, but it is not measured in the classical method, so it is additional. Uh, yeah, I think the low molecular weight, and you, you analysts can correct me if I'm wrong, yeah. includes things like some of the oligosaccharides, perhaps some uh, starch fragments, and a few other things. He could, he could tell us, yes. <laughs> no, it's a rather elegant method, but it's, it's complex, and you've got to have a, a well-trained analyst. To yeah, there's, sometimes there's a person, they have this automated equipment for doing the fire. Yeah. And the person selling this equipment has magnificent lectures saying it is so complex. So every manager of the laboratory will say, okay, give me this method, then the analyst cannot make this thing. Yeah, but sometimes, as the analysts know, sometimes uh, 
Analytical methodology is more an art, and you can't always rely on the equipment. You have to know when the equipment isn't doing what you expect. So, so okay. I had a question about this uh, the 2014 analysis of the pulses. That you yes. Had. Has that already been updated into the uh, Boot database? Uh, not yet. We're looking, we're in the process of redesigning our database system and we're looking to releasing that in the fall. Okay, so if, there, if you have a new analysis like this that you're going to put in, does the old data still be available to be able to say, well, what was it before? Yeah, as part of our plan is that our redesigning our system, we do intend to make that old data available in archive uh, values. So you can go back and see what it was you know, two years ago or even like 10 years ago. In fact, all our releases of standard reference going back to release 11 are available on our website if you want to look at them. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you again. Okay.